Hello, good day and a warm welcome from Metal Headquarters in Innsbruck, Austria. Welcome to our latest installment of Surgery Online. My name is Peter Clemente and I work here at Metal Headquarters in the Education Training Department and I'm responsible for our in-house temporal bone lab. Um, I would like to welcome everyone from around the world where they found the time to, to join us. Our today's topic is uh, remarks on cochlear implant revision surgery, um, and for this we are very happy to have our speaker, Professor Joachim Müller from Munich. Um, uh, first of all, before we before we start, I would like to uh, ask my colleagues to maybe uh, let me click a slide further, please. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, okay, good. Just some technical issues here. One second, please. Okay. Just going back one slide. Good. Um, I would like to start with uh, with some some housekeeping, um, as we usually do. Um, <clears throat> the uh, you are by default uh, muted, yeah, and we would like to keep it this way, just not to to interrupt anything during the presentation. Uh, we would first of all like to ask you if you can please like name or rename yourself if not done so already and maybe add your organization and the country you are joining us from um, this can be done by searching your name in the participants list and hovering the mouse over your name moving to the right side and with the more function with the drop down menu you can use the rename function and just put your name organization and country inside that would be great thank you uh, like i said you are muted um, and we will unmute you if you use the raise your hand function and we would like to ask you that we can do this in the very end if there's any questions that will um, arise from the presentation we were about to hear um, and also additionally for a stable internet connection if possible maybe close all other applications on your computer which will allow a very smooth um, stream on your side receiving good of course at any stage comments and questions are welcome the chat function is working all right. Um, I would now, of course, like to um, also welcome Professor Joachim Müller, uh, otolaryngologist from uh, from Munich, from the Ludwig Maximilian University Hospital in Munich, in Germany. Um, Professor Müller has a vast experience with cochlear implants. Um, he has about three thousand uh, implants done uh, thus far, and he will be talking about uh, the cochlear revision surgery today. Professor Müller, are you with us? Uh, hello, yeah. good afternoon from the surgical theaters in Munich University. Thank you for inviting me to talk with surgery online. And as we have discussed or agreed, um, the main part of this talk will be a revision uh, surgery video, which uh, Magdalena gratefully has cut for me in the very last minutes. So it's very fresh. I haven't seen it myself. So it's a little bit of surprise for uh, all of us. Uh, but uh, I think some ideas which are related to revision surgery can be discussed with this. Uh, as I've learned shortly, I also can add some PowerPoints, which I will try, but I'm not sure if this is working because this is prepared also in the very last moment like surgeons do and i'll try to share my powerpoint with you and give you some ideas now You should see my PowerPoint and you will be faced with some ideas on cochlear implant revisions. Well, revisions will become more frequently because we have seen a huge expansion of indications which leads to a lot of implantations and thus number of revisions will increase also. Through the last uh, decades, we have seen different surgical techniques, 
which may make a revision more easier or more difficult. And I will address this during the surgical video. Well, in Germany for uh, reimbursement issues, it is important to differentiate clearly uh, between uh, reasons for revision surgery. And if you look on the internet, like modern people do, uh, this description or differentiation varies among manufacturers. Trauma is a clear situation, which is uh, a sudden event and is covered by insurance uh, companies. Technical defects may be related uh, to electronic failures or leakages. And if you take a chance to visit uh, cochlear implant help, then you will see that even among different manufacturers, the recall rates uh, and the recall numbers vary quite differently. So as we used to be or discuss in car industry, this may be also a sign of quality. And luckily enough, you are the company with the lowest number of recalls. And of course, we have uh, medical reasons, infections, skin flaptions, which are related to patient or to sur surgical issues. And this is also covered by the insurance companies. And that's in, in our uh, area, it is important to get the reimbursement for the patient. And of course, it would be better to have less medical complications related to your surgical technique or whatever than having more. Well, we have to report to the notified bodies and this is differently calculated. Also, this gives room for speculation as well as going to the internet. Again, this is an older chart, which I found on my one of my older presentations. And this is the way how reporting should be technical, medical and trauma cases included. So that everybody can calculate whatever numbers he needed. And uh, the technical part of the implant or the revision is not blamed to a technical uh, failure instead of to a trauma. But I think this is what I want to say so far in a forward. I have some more pictures later on for you. But at the moment, I continue with the video because it's called Surgery Online. So we'll start the next presentation for you and go to you through the video. I cannot hear the audience, but uh, I want to ask the organizers if we should have a stop in between for question and answers, or shall we see the video at the end, which means I have to talk 30 minutes fluently without any break. We, we were thinking addressing questions in the end, but I think in between, if the audience will use the raise your hand function, um, our supporting colleagues from our ICM team uh, can can intervene and, and we can address questions if that is fine. So if, if you see an urgent question coming up in the chat room, uh, just let me know or speak in between and I pause the video and can discuss. That makes it more interactively I will thank more lively. You. Thank you. Now, this is a, a, a meanwhile adult young man, which has been implanted more than 20 years ago. He went to university and uh, made a good exam, is working properly. And uh, I have chosen this uh, case because this is something the majority of, of upcoming implant surgeons will be faced with. So after having um, opened the skin, we are facing soft tissues. And the question is, what do we want to do? 
and how go we further. The first is what we can localize by palpation. We can see and look for the implant housing. This was a ceramic housing at that time, uh, which is still of my, one of my favorite because it cost only a few um, medical revisions due to uh, granulations and infections because it has a nice surface and it was slim and thin. And I was trained to do cochlear implant surgery with this. As you see, the red thing is blood, which has to be taken away with the cotton or swapped. And then after we have identified the housing, we need to get an idea where are the borders of the housing, where are the electrodes, uh, where are the electrodes leading into uh, the mastoid cavity and where are they going? And you now see a little silver thing. And surprisingly, this is an electrode. Of course, it's important to know which type of implant we have to explant. This is uh, the ceramic housing with two electrodes. And this is the ground electrode, which was placed deep to the temporalis muscle. And easily you can see when lifting up the temporalis muscle that the electrode is pressed into the bone and properly immobilized. If you don't stay with the electrode in the initial surgery under the temporalis muscle and the fascia, uh, then you will have a mobile electrode and maybe create a electrode cable fracture, which of course is not a fault of the implant. It's a fault of the surgeon who did not place the electrode properly. With different instruments, the electrode is freed, scar tissue is taken away, and depending on the, on the reasons why we do the revision, of course, the aim for like Olympic idea is to keep all the electrodes intact for later on investigations to see what had happened and uh, caused the revision if it's based on technical uh, reasons. However, technical reasons are, the, are less frequent than medical or trauma. In children, to my knowledge, trauma is the most important reason. What you see now is that we follow all the electrodes we have seen one electrode. We have seen one electrode. Can you see the cursor? Can Sie mein Cursor sehen auf Ihrem Bildschirm? Uh, yes, yeah, we, we, we can see it. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, this is the ground electrode, and this is the active electrode. And the active electrode is leading towards the mastoid, and as you see here, the electrode is also nicely immobilized by uh, a bony channel. And this is due to the fact that the electrode was recessed in the prior surgery. Now, just for orientation, we are looking behind the ear, this area here above is the ear canal. This is the mastoid process, the bone behind the ear, which you can also feel when you put your fingers behind your pinna. And this is like in all revision surgeries, expose the clear landmarks. Then we follow the electrodes towards um, its course. This again is not in the mastoid. This is the ground electrode. This is the most unpleasant situation 
when you lift up the muscle and you're looking into a pouch and then you have to drill away the bone uh, around the electrode channel. However, modern elect uh, implant systems have the ground electrode on the housing, which makes revision surgery a little bit more comfortable. It is discussed contro controversially whether you should or can relieve some parts of the electrodes or not. Our opinion is to remove everything. And you see how the muscle has pressed over the decades of the life of this young boy, the electrode into the channel. And as far as I remember, the impedances were not changes and the electrical parameters were still perfect over more than two decades. However, as in all electronic devices, like your TV or whatever, someday lifetime has to end. And then we have to revise the implant. So this is still the part of the surgery where we follow the ground electrode and looking for the leaflet at the end. This is always a situation where you have to polite to the assisting nurse because she holds the hook and gives you space for preparation of the ground electrode. The covering bone is, is drilled away. However, it is, we could imagine that the electrode is pressed more deeply into the bone and reach the dura, but that is something the surgeon has to consider not to puncture the dura or to damage the dura while removing the electrode. And this is avoided when the electrode is exposed in a way as you see it here. And all three leaflets has to be removed and then the electrode can be separated out of the channel or simply retracted. The electrode looks nice with these shiny wires inside and they are more stable. Well, next step is to use, to, to remove the implant housing and to use the situation given by anatomy and the previous uh, implant bed to create the new bed. This is drilled in a way as it is done in every elective surgery and in, the, in, in every primary surgery, we mark the situation for the implant housing. We collect the bone pate and using the templates, we, we drill it properly. Bear in mind that the active electrode inside the cochlea is still in place. And this is all done, work done prior to paying attention to the mastoid and the electrode. The reason why everything is done beforehand is the most dangerous situation is the removal of the active electrode out of the cochlea and keep the interval for the insertion of the new electrode as short as possible. It is described in the literature that people have simply removed the implant at the beginning. They were happy that they had everything out, including the active electrode. 
And when it comes to electrode insertion, the cochlea was blocked and no electrodes could be inserted. Fayad in an older paper reported, uh, I think it was Fayad, 7% uh, of uh, impossible reinsertions. So that's the concern of the surgeon while doing all the preparations um, properly before removing the electrode. The bed is drilled with a with a cutting burr, and bleeding is stopped with a diamond later on. And uh, as we do for all primary surgeries, we prefer to drill a bed to get a proper immobilization of the implant. Well, in the end, we we stop the time for implant bed preparation which is about 12 to 17 minutes. So that's not too much compared to a lifetime of implant use. But for us, it gives a little bit more safety and we feel better if the implant is safe, stabilized, immobilized and not moving. However, the bed should be as deep as two millimeters. Sometimes you can reach the dura, which is not a problem. And then old fashioned are we, as we are, we like to tie down the implant and keep it for some weeks, properly additional fixed until scar tissues um, immobilize the implant. You may have, re you may remember the first pictures, how fixed the implant housing was when we are dissecting the electrodes. No movement at all. And this technique is still applied after 25 years because we have, or oh, we felt that it is proven standards. Also the, the fixation with uh, resorbable sutures created, creating an a spider web and preparing the small channels lateral to the dura for the thread is still adapted. However, you can nicely discuss whether you should have uh, four holes, five holes, two holes, or fix it at all, but doing quite some cases of revisions after 20, 25 years from our own series, we still recommend that. Meanwhile, the implant housing is, is removed. That's a question of uh, personal choice, whether you remove the housing and then remove the electrode. If you cut off the active electrode, handling is much easier. If you don't cut off the electrode, the magnet of the implant can help the uh, can can hold the implant at the. Um, retractor in position. And then the electrode, as you see here, is followed towards the mastoid cavity. And the CT scan prior to surgery has shown us that the cavity is aerated and the mastoid plane is closed by new bone formation. This is something which you, especially in children, see very quickly within a few weeks, the mastoid plane will be closed by new and regrown bone. And of course, this has to be drilled away. And you see this drilling is done with a diamond. 
just in case if I touch the electrode, the diamond will not wrap the electrode around the rotating burr. And I still hope that this helps to protect me from retracting the electrode too early out of the cochlea. This is also the reason why I cut off the next piece of the electrode to get the mastoid plane widely opened. And when I have an idea where the mastoid plane is, no electrode around, then the desired channel towards the mastoid is drilled. And under the scar tissue, you see new bone formation. And what you also see, and this is why I have selected this case, is that a child implanted at age of six months, where we drilled the mastoid completely, leads to a mastoid cavity of, of this size. But the child grows. He is now a young man. And aeration and growth of the mastoid process continues also. And therefore, we have new areas of pneumatized mastoid air cells developing over the years and making the mastoid much bigger compared to what we have seen in, in early childhood when the mastoid was drilled completely. And this is the number one key message for the surgeons be aware that the mastoid process grows and the anatomical proportions will distort while the child is growing before you have uh, to do the revision. And of course, this makes further drilling mandatory for the uh, pneumatized cells as well as for the bone formation that closed the mastoid plane. Only little scar tissues around the electrode and you see how nicely this electrode is uh, covered by a very thin tissue layer which for me indicates how biologically nicely acceptable this material is. Of course, drilling away the aerated cells is also necessary to make the exchange of the electrode easier and get a little bit or wider ex excess and room for preparations. Scar tissues around the electrode are selected and dissected carefully, always keeping in mind not to retract the electrode out of the cochlea. The next step is to follow the electrode, which is sometimes also covered with a thin layer of bone and nicely immobilized in the mastoid. And in the depths, you nicely can see the incus, which the previous surgeon gratefully has clearly exposed for us. That makes orientation in revision cases much easier. It's not the case in all revisions, but again, nicely aerated. And again, step by step, taking out the electrode in a way. And now you see nicely the titanium clip, which fixes the electrode in the facial recess. Also some thin layers of tissues 
around, but also a nicely aerated facial recess. And this is a nice picture which explains the anatomy. This is facial nerve, nicely exposed. This was the posterior tum anatomy uh, at the time when this child was implanted. And here you see the border of the bone where we laterally drilled away the new metastasis cells. So from here to here, this is all new mastoid growth. So this is not an incomplete dissection of the previous surgeon. This is growth of the mastoid process. And that can be used to make the reinsertion easier. And you see that the facial nerve uh, recess was very wide and the facial nerve was exposed and thus the revision procedure is much easier compared to a situation where you have to sort out the anatomy and the facial nerve first. However, with the diamond, some bone and these new developed cells can be taken away. However, with the facial nerve be exposed in the depths it's comparable easy. One of the dangerous things would be to just pull out the electrode at that stage of the surgery. And I would like to encourage you in case you have to do a revision like this, uh, to open the facial recess furthermore and get more overview. With diamond burrs adapted to the size we need for the situation, we stepwise skeletize the anterior rim of the facial nerve in the facial recess. We can expose the corda in the posterior canal wall, which was shining through the bone and then the face recess, the lower part of the face recess then is paid attention to and uh, drilled furthermore. Yeah, irrigation is mandatory. Sometimes vision is blocked, but stepwise, we open up the facial recess. Avoid drilling without irrigation. Avoid overheating in or close to the facial nerve area. But this is basics, which of course apply here as well. Another danger in this situation is that the thin fibrous tissue sleeve around the electrode will wrap around the burr and retract the electrode. To avoid this, the clip 
remains closed to give additional protection. And But you see, this part of the surgery needs some patient to really get access to the tympanic cavity. And once you have identified the facial, step by step, the bone is removed. And then you have an extremely large facial recess which is not done because I was planning to present this at surgery online. This is done to increase the safety for the moment of the electrode retraction and new insertion for the patient. In case of something happens, which is unexpected, you need space and you need space to work down at the entrance of the electrode in into the cochlea and the more space you have, the better it is. So if you right, you clearly see this is the cochlea to me that was done at that time of the primary surgery. This is the facial nerve. And from here, where the facial nerve was identified in the initial surgery, this is grown of the mastoid and grown of the facial recess. And that can be used to get better access to the cochlea. Next step is then to dissect the fibrous tissue around the electrode and to open the electrode and the clip. Usually we find a thin fibrous tissue sleeve onto the electrode. And this has to be dissected all around the coclostoma to avoid any adhesions and uh, avoid any rubber bandage effect when you extract the electrode that pulls the soft tissues back into the cochlea. Once the tissue sleeve that I'm dissecting here is rejected into the cochlea, you have lost. You will not get in the electrode properly. And you will hardly have a chance to get the fibrous tissue out of that because the upper end, so to say, stays deeper in the cochlea. All around the coclostoma is this fibrous tissue selected. However, the fibrous tissue grows around the electrode and inside the cochlea varies from different electrode types. This standard electrode or the flex soft electrodes, in, in my experience, produce, so to say, 
very little amounts of uh, scar tissue and fibrous tissue inside the cochlea. And they are really nicely to removed. With the metal electrode forceps, the electrode can retract it and remove without forces. The fluid you have seen at the moment is uh, prednisolone just to protect. And while the electrode was inserted, the new implant, sorry, the new implant is already in place and the new electrode is inserted immediately after removal of the first electrode and the silicone ring again corks the cochlea nicely. And as we can check with the claw, it corks properly. Soft tissue is wrapped around. Uh, what you all see nicely is this uh, tube, which is used to apply cortisone while as a continuous irrigation uh, while inserting the electrode. That's an idea. Uh, that MedL Japan has introduced to me. It's uh, based on the investigations by Yama, Yamauchi from Sendai. And they had a nice research on that. And of course, that's so useful that we adapted it. I can recommend it. You just put the tube in the antrum and then you can continuously irrigate, avoid air bubbles going into the cochlea and have um, some cortisone and on the electrode, maybe protecting hearing preservation. And then soft tissue is wrapped around. To seal the cochlea against spread of infection, as it is recommended as a standard procedure after the meningitis uh, issue that came up in around 2000 with pre-curved electrodes and electrode twist positioner. And you see also we save money and take the same clip again. Thank you to Medel that this clip is now commercially available and we can use it for every uh, primary intervention. And then the electrode is coiled. Well, you see the new implant was already placed in the bed that had been made before. so much for no, the that's it <laughs> i apologize for not recording the fixation of the implant and not recording of the skin closure but usually recording is done through the microscope which is used with a video uh, supply for the nurses assisting and that makes uh, recording of the of the critical steps quite easy Hey, thank you very much for this great presentation, Professor Müller. Um, so I would actually like to ask our audience if there's any questions. Yeah, um, We would love to ask you to either write it in the chat or maybe use the raise your hand function and we can address that. Uh, I have I have one question popping up uh, from um, from Sören here in the chat. If I may read it to you, Professor Müller. Uh, it's, uh, Dear Professor Müller, have you ever seen any side effect by using a clip like allergic reaction, etc.? No. No. It's it's made from titanium, and this is known in in uh, mid phase repair or for middle ear prosthesis to be extremely good biocompatible. No side effects from the clip. 
Okay, thank you very much. Good. Um, please also feel free to to use the raise your hand function. We will unmute your micros uh, microphone then. Uh, I do see another question here. Um, how do you decide which implant to use for reimplantation? Is having a stylet in the implant for reinsertion important? Well, uh, stylet is stylet is, in my opinion, bullshit because it makes the electrode too stiff. And uh, well. First question is, we have a CT scan prior to uh, revision surgery. Uh, that gives us sometimes a little bit of evidence if there's soft tissue inside the cochlea. We know the length of the electrode that is uh, inserted. And well, the idea is always to use the longest electrode possible. Having a standard metal electrode with 31 millimeter uh, inserted in the primary surgery, the revision surgeon is or has advantages. Um, usually it should work out that the same length of electrode uh, can be reinserted. In a situation where the electrode might have moved a little bit outside, uh, at the stage of the surgery where the uh, fibrous tissue sleeve is uh, dissected, the electrode can be with the claw or with the forceps uh, pushed in a little bit deeper. And that gives you an idea whether there is some reserve in depth for insertion. So if you have, for example, um, a standard electrode with... Uh, um, one electrode contact outside, I would dissect the, uh, the cochleostoma. Also, sometimes with a 0.8 um, or 0.6 millimeter diamond, the bony cochleostoma can be uh, extended and then the electrode can be inserted more deep. That's maybe something that should we bear in mind uh, once we have to revise electrodes that had been inserted through the round window, which usually make a little curve into the scalar tympani of the basal turn. Once uh, the hearing is gone, drilling does not uh, compromise the, the residual hearing, but taking away some more bone to get a more tangentially uh, access to the basal turn may um, make the insertion more easy. The other question, uh, if you want to have a, a shorter electrode with stylet or without stylet or pre-curved or whatever, and you want to insert a, a longer electrode, that's, to my experience, also possible. Um, if you have time, I can show you some, some pictures of a revision where a 22 millimeter electrode was exchanged for a 31 millimeter and the patient improved from 20% or 30% numbers to 35% or 40% words. In these cases, the so surgical procedure would be exactly the same, but instead of fixing the implant first, uh, we would use a, a dummy electrode and insert the dummy electrode uh, as deep as we uh, want to go. And when we succeed, then the dummy electrode stays into, in the cochlea, the implant is face, uh, fixed, and then the electrode is exchanged. Um, however, when drilling at the cochleostoma, the, the soft tissue sleeve and the soft tissue inside the cochlea need to be dissected very carefully, not to wrap around the burr and not to be pushed into the depths of the cochlea because that, as I have mentioned frequently, will block the cochlea and make uh, reinsertion impossible. 
Great, thank you. There was another question which uh, I would actually say you you already answered with the previous answer. Um, it is, uh, do you use the same length of the electrode? Do you calculate the length of the electrode? So that was partially answered already. But yeah, we, we have started for nowadays uh, implantation in terms of residual hearing or preservation of uh, residual vestibular function to adjust the electrode lengths uh, according to the, the auto plan. But uh, in reality, the mo vast majority of the implants are uh, classical cochlear implants. And in, in these cases, usually 31 millimeter fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my wish would be, as we know from auto plan, to uh, Fit or fit have electrodes that fit better for longer cochleas to have a 34 millimeter electrode. But uh, as we also know from, from the line, uh, longer electrodes uh, need a little bit more attention to be carefully inserted. I would not say it's more difficult, but um, yeah, some people make their life, in my opinion, too easy and um it's worthwhile to pay attention to that all right um there's more questions coming in if i may um there is one question what is your general experience in using a fixation tool again for the new electrode after removal any loss in holding force no there's no loss of of holding force uh, this is simply save money if if the uh, if the clip is uh, removed and uh, destroyed or bended, we would use a new one. If we are lucky and can preserve it, then uh, as you have seen the, the diameter of, of the second part of the clip, which closes around the electrode is adapted to the diameter of the electrode. So even if you close um, uh, the clip completely, it uh, cannot compress or damage uh, the 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 wires inside the cochlea. Claude Jolie has looked into that some years ago, and we haven't seen in any use any wire damage at the side of the clip in any of the exchanged implants. Hmm. Great, uh, thank you. There is another question that came up. So, following a cochlear implant activation, if there is evidence of electrode extrusion, which might be confirmed by X ray or impedance changes for basal electrodes or performance decline or non auditory um, yeah. stimulation, would a revision surgery be considered? Or would the procedure involve advancing the electrode array or reimplantation? And there's a thank you in advance already. Well, um... Yes, if you have a sign of, of electrode migration outside of the cochlea, uh, which happens from time to time, um, the, the revision surgery and replacement is, is considered strongly and also offered to the patient because the first sign is uh, changes in, in sound uh, quality or in, in uh, speech understanding performance. Some of the people just reinsert the electrode uh, at down to the level they were in before. Some of them exchange the implant. And uh, in in general, it depends on on what we find. If if the electrode is with two or three contacts outside of the cochlea in the middle ear space and uh, we have seen middle ear infections or uh, inflammations, I would be concerned that the electrode and the silicone of the electrode carrier is infection infected and, and carries uh, bacteria or biofilm particles. And thus I would exchange the whole system. Others don't have these uh, uh, ideas and uh, insert the electrode fully. Mm -hmm. In case of a, let's say, Flex 28 electrode where the hearing was uh, was lost or is at the time at a level where it 
cannot be used for combined electric stimulation. I would also consider uh, to exchange the Flex 28 uh, to a Flex Soft or 31 millimeter electrode to get even more stimulation length. But that's, that's my personal preference. And in the selected cases where I have done this, we have seen also improvement in speech understanding in noise in, in a handful of, of cases where we did that. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question that just popped in. Stating, uh, dear Professor Miller, do you see any obstacles or benefits for performing revision surgeries in patients with, which have undergone minimally invasive single drill tunnel surgeries? Thank oh you. Oh, God. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, I actually do not know what uh, invasive single drill tunnel surgery is, but well, 20 years ago, there were different techniques available, Varia technique, Kronberg technique, uh, supramiatal approach. And uh, I had uh, the pleasure or better say unpleasure to revise one of these situations. Now I go into my presentation and show you something. Um, the, uh, and uh, the question, sorry, so the question was just added like the hero procedure or the hero approach, for example. But I think you know, with the varia, you're also quite there. Well, the the hero procedure is uh, straightforward. It's a channel, and you have to coil out the the electrode outside. And I'm not sure if if the concept of hero surgery is uh, thought to an end of uh, revision surgeries from Varia technique. Um, some surgeons report, oh, it's it's easy in, easy out. That's not my experience. I'm clearly a favor of landmark based surgery to get the electrode really inside the cochlea. Once you have done a revision after revision of a single channel surgery and the electrode was not in the cochlea. So it's not necessarily, the channel not necessarily must lead in a revision surgery into the same hole in the cochlea. Kirasidis said he was able to uh, uh, revise and exchange the implant through the same channel. I have never seen it, but I have seen other things which I want to share with you. Please. That's the Bildschirm freigeben. But that's a, a question of personal preference. Maybe I'm not I'm not talented enough to, to do so. Well, this is a revision surgery where the master it was not drilled properly. You have an electrode here with a lot of scar tissues and no idea where the facial nerve is. Of course, you can sort out the facial nerve and create clear, uh, clear landmarks, but it takes time. It's not so pleasant as in the video you have seen before. You have to find the facial nerve. You have to create a large facial recess. And you see this electrode carrier has much more scar tissue around. Hmm. We have dissected the cochleostoma and we have seen penetration into scalar tympani. And we have inserted a dummy electrode and then afterwards a longer electrode. And this answers also the question if you are able to insert longer electrodes after having use of a shorter electrode. And again, here again, the implant is in place. The new implant is already placed and uh, apply prior to removal. And then the electrode is inserted and longer electrodes. This confirms as a single case, again, lead to better speech understanding. So if, if or my policy having in mind that my revisions will be done in 20 years by the upcoming generation of surgeons um, is to expose 
expose clear landmarks and make it more easy. It was a clear statement. Thank you very much. Um, I think but it looks like that there's... When I say a word about, about the hero expo approach, well, the hero can do his own revisions and maybe he can do it better than surgeons can do. <laughs> All right. So yeah, it doesn't seem like that there's any more questions and we don't have any raised hands from the audience. Um, I would love to say thank you so much again for this great presentation and topics and answering all the questions. Um, if there's still more questions, then please, of course, still write something in the chat. Um, but other than that, I would, yeah, I would like to Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you for watching. Um, thank you, Professor Miller, once again, for taking the time and, and giving us this insight into your experience with all the implantation and a little bit of re-implantation. I would just also like to point out the next surgery online, which is going to happen on a Thursday this time, yeah, on uh, April the 28th this year, also from 3 to 4 Central European time. It's going to uh, be about yeah, treating a treasure in children um, and how an expert decides between vibrant sound bridge and or bone bridge. And our guest speaker is going to be uh, Professor Francois Denoyer. And yeah, with that, like I said, thank you all very much. Professor Müller, some final words? Thank you very much. I do hope you enjoyed. Be precise with your surgery and make revision easier by clear landmarks in the previous or initial surgery. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. And goodbye, everyone. Have a nice day.